Vladimir Putin's Russia has finally attacked Ukraine. The final strategy, the latest phase in his reckless operation that was launched by welcoming two new countries onto the global political chessboard, or at least Russia's version of the world map. On Monday, the 21st of February, Russian President Vladimir Putin signed decrees recognizing the independence of the Donetsk People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic in eastern Ukraine. And that is not all. The Russian president also ordered his defense minister to immediately deploy the Russian army to these two new republics to carry out a peacekeeping operation, which of course, coming from Putin's mouth, meant anything but peace. It did not take long to see the consequences. In fact, along the same lines, the Russian government itself has sent the defense and security treaties reached with the New People's Republics to the Duma for ratification. And now, we're all witnessing the grand moves that Moscow is so fond of. Here, on Visual Politics, we've already told you how this move, the full recognition of the independence of these two republics, was more than likely. It is a move that is part of Moscow's usual playbook and something we've already seen in the cases of Transistria, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia. Yet, the deployment of Russian troops in the self-proclaimed Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics marked the first formal incursion of Russian troops into legally what is Ukrainian territory and is a blatant violation of the Minsk II agreement. Agreements. It was a prelude to the attacks that soon followed. At first, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, claimed that this move, although it was a clear violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and the Minsk II agreement, had simply legalized the activity that the Russian army had been carrying out in the region since 2014. Ukraine later decreed a state of alarm, mobilized thousands of reservists, and launched preparations to try and cope with an invasion. This is the reality that everyone more or less knew, that Moscow denied, and that is now alarming because it has been confirmed, especially considering how Russia has surrounded Ukraine by land, sea, and air. Be that as it may, the point, Visual Politic viewers, is that this whole situation raises a few key questions. What has been happening in the self-proclaimed Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics? And what conclusions can we draw? And perhaps the most important question of all, what exactly do these republics look like and what do they tell us about the future of occupied parts of Ukraine? Let's take a look. The New People's Republics Since their self-proclaimed independence in 2014, these new republics have been almost completely isolated from the rest of Ukraine. Well, from the rest of Ukraine and practically the whole world, with the exception, of course, of Russia. Over the years, they have formed one of the most opaque, closed and militarized territories on the planet. But to find out how they have fared, let us first take a look at the few basic facts to help us get our bearings. Until Russia unleashed the storm on the 24th of February 2022, the Donetsk People's Republic was about 3,400 square miles, that's 8,900 square kilometers and had about 2.3 million inhabitants. The man you see on the screen, Denis Pushilin, was himself part of a huge pyramid scheme in Russia and Ukraine and is now their leader. The Luhansk People's Republic was around 3,200 square miles, 8,300 square kilometers and had 1.6 million inhabitants. In total, we are talking about 6,680 square miles, 17,300 square kilometers, the equivalent of the area of Kuwait or Swaziland and 3.9 million inhabitants. Although the actual population may have been much lower. Let's just say that it is difficult to pinpoint due to the huge population displacements caused by the conflict that began in 2014, the year that gave shape to these two new republics. On the 22nd of February 2014, the then president of Ukraine and Moscow ally, Viktor Yanukovych, fled the capital and office as a result of the protests triggered by the Euromaidan revolution. And that, right there, is where the storm began. Russia responded to the Euromaidan revolution by annexing Crimea with the famous Men in Green and fueling the uprising in the east of the country. However, while the seizure of Crimea was clean, the uprisings in eastern Ukraine were nothing short of chaotic. The protests in Donetsk and Luhansk soon gave way to armed conflict between Ukraine's new government and local militias backed by Moscow. Initially, the pro-Russian rebels advanced quickly and took control of almost all of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. However, the counterattack by the Ukrainian army and particularly their volunteer battalion forced Russia to send in tanks, anti-aircraft batteries and long-range artillery to stop the offensive and forced Ukraine to agree to a ceasefire and sign the Minsk II agreements. From then until 2022, the front line remained more or less stable. 
The Minsk II agreements were an attempt to end the conflict. Pushed forward by France and Germany with a lot of skepticism from the US, the agreement recognized Ukrainian sovereignty in exchange for Kiev granting the rebel regions a special autonomous status. Of course, the definitions were vague and in the end, neither side kept its word. What's more, the conflict never actually ended. Sniper fire and artillery exchanges were constant on both sides. In total, the conflict is estimated to have claimed between 14,000 and 20,000 lives, as well as displacing at least 2 million people. In other words, the Minsk II agreements were another one of those verbose European operations full of good intentions, but which, when it comes down to it, nobody really believes, not even the signatories themselves. This is how the new People's Republic of Donetsk and Luhansk came into being. Two republics living in a state of permanent virtual war. Institutions were assaulted. An ultra-nationalist, conservative and militarised model was imposed and many, if not most, of the large enterprises and productive assets such as mines or steel mills were expropriated or put at the disposal of oligarchs friendly to Moscow. Take, for example, the case of Yevgeny Yurgovichenko, a Russian investor who now controls the most valuable assets. And yes, they of course also established a heavy-handed political police model. They've managed to rebuild a Soviet system in the occupied territories, and not the Soviet system of the 1960s and 1970s, but the Soviet system of the 1930s and 1940s, with dungeons, with torture chambers, a system where lives are ruined if you dare to write or say anything negative about these republics and their authorities. Stanislav Asiev, novelist and journalist from Donetsk. This had been one of the most developed territories in the whole of Ukraine. Of course, as you can imagine, all of this had consequences. Check this out. The Ruin Today, it seems hard to believe, but just a decade ago, Donetsk was one of the most important venues of the European Soccer Championship, Euro 2012, a high-profile sporting event that was hosted by Ukraine and Poland. To host the competition, the city spruced itself up. Much of the city was restored, a new airport was built, roads were repaired, and shiny new hotels were opened. Nor was this so unusual. The Donetsk and Luhansk regions formed the so-called Rust Belt, the economic engine of the whole of Ukraine, an important mining and industrial enclave, home to the country's largest steel mills. And not only that, Donetsk was also the home and main headquarters for the empire of Renat Akhmenatov, Ukraine's richest man, a billionaire whose fortune Forbes estimates at around $7 billion. Nevertheless, the fact is that today, all of that's behind us. Infrastructure is in tatters. Mobile phone and internet service is patchy at best. Economic activity has collapsed. Jobs have disappeared and about half, half of the population could have emigrated to the rest of Ukraine, Russia or elsewhere in Europe, particularly Poland. And of course, international companies and chains have closed their doors. They're locked up tight. There used to be a lot of enthusiasm for the Donetsk People's Republic in the beginning. Everyone was chanting, DPR, DPR, DPR. Now, there is just a lot of disappointment. The economy there has collapsed. The jobs are gone. There is nothing good there. Alexander Gayevoy, exile from Donetsk region. Today, these two republics have become very, very poor territories. Two regions that basically survive on smuggling and Russian funding. In fact, they're technically all Russian. The official currency is the ruble, the citizens have been issued Russian passports, they have access to Russian social benefits, and their leaders have joined Putin's political party. So it seems independence is a bit of a bad joke. Perhaps we could talk about autonomy at most. What's more, the future doesn't look bright. Without international recognition, investment and trade will be very difficult. To make matters worse, following Russia's recognition of the two regions' independence, President Joe Biden has banned any US company, entity or citizen from engaging directly or indirectly in investment projects, exports, imports, financing or any other business dealings with these territories. Many other countries around the world, from Canada to Australia to the European Union, are all doing the same. Donetsk and Luhansk have been cut off from the international community. What was, until recently, the most prosperous place in Ukraine is now a huge ruin. Interestingly, it was the Ukrainian cities in the Donbass that benefited the most. We are talking about cities that in the last few years have received a lot of workers and entrepreneurs from Russian-controlled areas.
This is, for example, the case of Kharkov, Ukraine's second most populous city. A city that historically has been closely linked to Russia and was one of the Soviet Union's main centers of military production. A city that pro-Russian rebels briefly occupied in 2014 until they were driven out by Ukrainian army's rapid reaction force. We're talking about a city where it is estimated that back in 2014, barely a third of the population was loyal to the Ukrainian government. That percentage, by the way, at the beginning of 2020 was estimated to have risen to over 70 percent, thanks precisely to the difference in economic development compared to the other territories in the hands of the pro-Russian rebels. Of course, all of this didn't bother Russia in the slightest. But yes, we can say that one of Moscow's greatest enemies is precisely the lack of future in its own model. Given the state of affairs in Russia itself, how can the Ukrainians not look to the West? They did, do, and will continue to do so. That all goes without saying. The fact is that Russia's recognition of the two people's republics set alarm bells ringing and did so because of one detail. Look at this map. On it, you can see the territory of the people's republics controlled in the darker color. And the lighter color is the territory they claimed. Russia backs Ukraine separatists for territorial claims the perfect excuse for Moscow. Unsurprisingly, the consequences were not long in coming. It was the beginning of the Western reaction. 22nd of February, Joe Biden imposes wave of sanctions on Russia for Ukraine invasion. US president targets elites, some banks and sovereign debt and says more measures will follow if Putin advances. Australia, Canada, Japan impose sanctions on Russia over Ukraine crisis. It seems, visual politics fans, that the experience of Donetsk and Luhansk do not allow us to be optimistic for the future of Ukrainians. And neither, mind you, for the Russians themselves. They will gain nothing and lose a lot. That's in addition, of course, to resounding international condemnation. We have credible information that indicates Russian forces are creating lists of identified Ukrainians to be killed or sent to camps following a military occupation. Russian forces will likely use lethal measures to disperse peaceful protests or otherwise counter peaceful exercises of perceived resistance from civilian populations. Bathsheba Nell Crocker, US representative to the United Nations. But having got this far, it's over to you. How do you think events will unfold? Leave us your answer in the comments below. And if you found this video interesting, which we hope you did, don't forget to like it. We will be talking about the Georgia case in detail very soon. So don't forget to subscribe to all our videos here at Visual Politic. All the best, good luck, and I'll see you next time.